Um, basically, I'm going to talk to you about our, approach, our uh, approaches toward uh, uh, integrating um, uh, sort of data and, and computation. And one of the things that we've really tried, which I think is very consistent with sort of the I, uh, IBM's approach and model, is <coughs> operating in very synergistic teams with where experimentalists and theorists are working very hand in hand. And our team is very much kind of engaged with experimental scientists. Uh, they sit right next to each other. They work with each other. In fact, recently there was a, a we had to we're, we're space constrained and we're building a new building in another side of town. And I had to move the entire team back to this building, and it caused a gigantic uproar because they didn't want to move away from the experimentalists. Um, over the years, what we build is we have historically built um, large sort of large scale uh, kind of. Uh, platforms for investigating kind of gene expression and, and various other kind of modalities uh, now. This is just an example here of the pipeline that was involved in sort of building a human brain atlas. It was um, started back in 2005, uh, and it was essentially using, at the time, because um, digital sequencing techniques were less robust at the time and not very cost effective, we used a sort of custom design microarray chip, and this was sampled and profiled in, in basically 900, 900 different locations of the human brain in six different um, basically sort of clinically unremarkable spe uh, specimens across race, across sex. Um, using this kind of resource, you can actually profile and understand uh, the gene expression uh, and its sort of effect of gene classes, local profiling, uh, of di how different anatomic regions relate to each other in the brain. We build these tools. Our, our, our philosophy is to build and put all our data online and make it all publicly available. So everything we do, even prior to publication, is essentially put out. It always creates a bit of a uh, kind of a you know a, a stress point for the people who are trying to publish on the data because our mandate is to put it out and we, we uh, try to uh, also write about it at the same time. Um, this just shows a, sort of an example of a human reference atlas of a brain from drawn uh, from a 34-year-old female. You can see the massive kind of cortex and the cortical folding. Um, we use these kinds of anatomic sort of atlases and, 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 and designs as sort of reference points and common coordinate systems for which data can be mapped into and, and, and studied. In a Nature article that summarized kind of the findings, initial findings of, of, of two to two and a half of the sort of the people that were using this atlas, um, there was a, sort of very interesting results that came up about the large scale genetic architecture of the human brain. One of the things shown in the lower kind of um, right-hand panel there is a kind of reconstruction of, of cortical sort of specimens in the brain based only on the knowledge of gene expression where it came from. In other words, if I gave you a collection of gene expression measurements from the brain, how well could you reconstruct, say, the human cortex from only knowing expression uh, values of a very key set of, say, uh, most substantially varying genes? And this just shows that the data shows that you can reproduce the about 35 to 40 percent of the variance explained in reconstructing a human brain based on gene expression alone. Um, we've been able to refine these maps uh, now. Uh, by, by, since all the data has kind of come in from these six brains, what I'm showing here is in a, in, a, in a result now that was actually made as a kind of a vignette that you can publicly browse online yourself at that uh, site below is this is showing a kind of consensus map. But this is a, a essentially a heat map showing the genetic differences between regions based on consensus differential expression between uh, pairs of regions in all six people. In other words, a, a bluer region in the upper left-hand corner, the cortex there, is showing a very, very homogeneous uh, sort of space in which sort of co, co uh, uh, areas of the cortex are basically not very genetically different from each other, except for uh, the sort of band in the upper left hand cross there, which is in fact the visual cortex, very startling sort of visual cortex thing. Down here you have this big blue patch, the cerebellum, indicating in fact there are no genes that are re differentially reproducible between people that separate compartments of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is an extraordinary, while you may find them in a given individual, on average, there's really no differentiating the compartments of the severe cerebellum genetically. So very, very interesting kind of kind of findings and things that can, can come out of this kind of architecture. Um, taking this as sort of a starting point, one can study these genes, which are in some sense differentially stable. Um, 
genes that sort of don't vary very much. Here we're looking at sort of this protocatarin kind of a cell adhesion molecule there. And you can see its profile here across uh, six different people. There's a remarkable kind of um, reproducibility in the data. And, and one can sort of study this and, and rank genes in the genome based on their reproducibility in the human brain. And one sees, like down in the lower right-hand corner there, that in fact, uh, sort of from a regulatory point of view, reg gene regulation, in terms of mRNA targets or long-coding non-RNA, non uh, uh, long non-coding RNAs, that basically that these stable genes are very much a class to themselves. They include the potassium channels of the brain, the calcium channels, all the sort of fundamental machinery. Interestingly, right to the, to the left of that, there's a, sm a slightly bar that says drug there, indicating that the top 5% of these stable genes in the brain have been the targets of essentially 97% of all drugs that have been either developed or drug interactions known, that, that a, a minuscule fraction is actually been studied for the sort of a, a lower variability genes. From this, one can sort of characterize these patterns and modules of gene expression in the human brain. Here I'm just showing a kind of these different reproducible kind of modules, each which have different kinds of bio uh, uh, sort of molecular signatures and, and functional signatures. Um, you can organize these based on cell type. Here's where I kind of connect the cell type. And basically studying with sort of known cell type specific databases, we can take these common modules and patterns and sort of order them and rank them based on how either neuronally specific they are or glially specific or other uh, kind of uh, cell types. Um, it allows us to find highly isolated, very specific cell type markers in the brain. Uh, here's a handful of genes which are in fact very, very, uh, it's like a, a uh, a sort of a panoply of, of, of who's who in neuroscience genes, from somatostatin to, to um, some Hox genes, uh, sort of developmental plans of genes in the brain, um, uh, synaptotagmin, and these are genes which don't fall into these kind of canonical modes, which are in some sense kind of outliers and very specific cell type markers in the brain. Um, like, as I said, one can sort of deeply annotate this data and come in. There's, uh, like you can't read that to tell why, but each of these modules has functional and kind of disease-based significance. Um, more on the connectivity level, we, we work, have worked in a variety of our atlases toward understanding kind of connectivity. One of the recent uh, projects was a, a, a mouse uh, kind of uh, laboratory standard C57 black and transgenic connectivity atlas of, of the mouse brain. Here we have a, an application we call Brain Explorer, where all this data is mapped into a common coordinate framework. And you're studying here a projection into the retina and following it through the LGN into sort of the visual cortex of, of, of the mouse. To understand cell type, though, we can't really work in this macro level. In, in essence, what I first described to you is a kind of, in a way, a resting state genetic network of the human brain. Now to go down to the details of cell type, one wants to do, uh, take advantage of the more recent uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, sort of progress in cell type specific profiling. You're basically using on, on uh, extracted, amplified, fact sorted sort of cells and doing RNA seq at a detailed level to understand the genetics of what happens in sort of the both transgenic and, and uh, the sort of normal tissue. Um, these are the kind of some of the things our group is building models for. We use, sort of, we're using basically generalized leaky integrated fire neurons studying with the experimentalists, looking at stimuli from measured recording neurons in the laboratory, uh, and showing, to, trying to see how well we can build both uh, point-based neuronal models and biophysically-based uh, neuronal models from these. Uh, if you take, take a couple of approaches, one of the conventional modeling approach is sort of the glyph models. Another are sort of statistical approaches toward data matching and essentially trying to reproduce stimulus firing in, 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 the, in the brain. Uh, the, this, this sort of here shows here that we can actually take behavioral stimulus of a mouse sort of looking at uh, various scenes, studying cortical activity maps, and, and actually sort of recognizing and classifying what the animal is partially sort of uh, seeing to, to, to some degree of, of success. Um, these kind of models, the idea is to put these together using both these point and biophysically realistic models into large-scale sort of simulations and large-scale uh, models that sort of uh, try to explain cortical layering, the effects, feedback, uh, error prediction, et cetera, uh, in, in the brain. Um, 
part of this, so to get this information, part of the thing that one, one needs to do is that you know you need to reconstruct the biophysically sort of realistic uh, cell. And we have a strong team sort of led by some of the people I'll show you in the end, the people on my team. Uh, one of the groups is a kind of a computational neuroanatomy group, which is uh, basically uh, working on developing automated and very careful uh, sort of mechanisms of, of segmenting re real cells from both in vitro and, and uh, in vivo sort of tissue. There's a lot of challenges in this because some of it is light-based, some of it is electron microscopy based, but the problem occurs because of in the imaging, there's, there are lots of breakages, there's lots of do, doing this in a sort of an automated way is, is very, very challenging, but necessary if one is to get sort of the very large scale simulations. Um, we've de designed kind of applications uh, that, are, that basically are able to do this, make predictive sort of uh, estimates as to where the neur neurons are sort of essentially branching, uh, connecting, uh, and we were able to populate large databases with these reconstructions. This was made by a very, this particular slide here made by a very enthusiastic colleague of mine who loves animation and slides. And uh, you can see they get the effect of that. So from these, the idea is that, that the main thing is this, is that if you're going to do large scale simulations of the brain, one of the big questions is, you know, where do you need to lie on this sort of simplified versus biophysically realistic modeling? It's a very, very critical thing. It's as, as the, the, the interesting Blue Brain Project approach of trying to put very biophysically realistic models into large scale simulations. The question is if you want to build you know, millions and millions of neurons with perhaps trillions of synapses, then you may need to make simplification. We would really like to understand where that boundary of biophysical realism is. Um, here we're showing that we actually, by look, having enough of the morphology, we can reproduce very, very well the cell signaling and essentially the, the firing patterns. Um, this is here a, a simulation that's sort of based, based on, by our kind of our, our biophysically realistic kind of uh, modeling group. It's sort of showing that basically where we're starting with uh, essentially real excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons that we're actually able to reconstruct from uh, in vitro data building up sort of simulate, the idea was to simulate uh, 10,000 neurons, which you're not seeing the full 10,000 here, but 10,000 neurons in a patch of layer four visual cortex based on e extremely sort of accurate biophysical information and connectivity patterns that are, 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 are justified by what we know from the data. Um, and the first part of the simulation shows a very sort of quiescent network according to sort of a, a resting state, kind of a very, very low input into, into the, into the uh, mouse's kind of thing. But basically, this is responding to a sort of a stimulus that, that is uh, shown to the mouse, uh, basically looking at grading patterns, essentially. Later in the simulation, we start to see that there's actually a more dynamic uh, kind of uh, exposure of the mouse to the stimulus. And here we can sort of see the, the firing patterns and, and the connectivity. So we, we use such simulations to try to model and to try to uh, put together sort of the big picture. Using data from this, we are trying to understand realistically what is happening in the human brain. Our, our orientation is, is less on the computing, but we want to use computing to attempt to model what's uh, kind of happening in the living organism. So here we're taking, we have been working with uh, various groups, the, the, uh, Henry Markham and the Blue Brain uh, group is, is one that we work with, in terms of taking data partially from our own, they're very interested in our data that we're producing with our modelers and their modelers, constructing, building uh, sort of large scale cortical realistically layered, layered realistic models, uh, incorporating the biophysics, uh, you know, using calcium imaging, using other, other kinds of uh, uh, neural firing, and building these uh, simulations. Uh, so the idea is to put these together to be able to measure local field potentials, inter and extracellular signaling, uh, in these kind of uh, simulations. Uh, so the idea is that one can you know, put these sort of uh, together to measure the kind of current source densities, the local field potentials, to simulate activity subject to various stimulus with very realistic kind of connectivity and, and uh, neural configurations. Uh, finally, the idea is to explain some of what the, what the brain does. One of the projects we're working on is a kind of stimulus decoding. And our theory group is uh, working on basically if, if the animal is shown stimulus, to what extent can you reproduce and predict what was shown? Some of this work, which was really done interestingly from an fMRI perspective in, in the lab of Jack Lamp, 
showing that certain fMRI uh, basically patterns could essentially be reproduced and, and predicted. Um, the, the idea is that can one do enhance this based on uh, dynamic firing, calcium imaging, and uh, a kind of more realistic kind of model. So yeah, this just sort of shows that, and it is a prototype experiment showing that in fact, that basically given a sort of a various images that one can, uh, working from sort of like frequency level decompositions, essentially using very low return low kind of compressive sensing, reproduce and, and sort of guess what the stimulus was shown. And I think that, that, that sort of, that's the approach that we want to uh, move, move into. And the idea is to, to understand moving more toward kind of understanding hierarchical computing in the brain. How does the brain perform uh, the uh, sort of different uh, uh, layer-based computations? For example, understanding uh, HMAX, various different theories and such like this. So the notion here is that we'd like to reproduce in the mouse uh, this kind of cognitive computing environment that has been uh, proposed in theory, in the human, and in very other uh, kind of things. Um, well, can you go to the last slide there? Uh, so these are some great people uh, in my group here. Uh, that uh, Han Xuan is responsible for all the uh, sort of the um, neuronal reconstructions. Uh, they're being, they do the kind of computational neuroanatomy and some of the mapping work into the common coordinate framework. Stefan uh, is, is our kind of statistical and, and, and point-based neuronal model and network modeler. Um, Anton uh, is a, a biophysically realistic model who built some with the technology team, built some of the simulations. Uh, Basilica works on, she's not really in my outfit, but, but I uh, got some of her materials that she's working on this, the cell type specific sequencing data. Um, and Costas is a, 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 a large scale biophysical modeler working with the Human Brain Project and Michael is a theory person. These are just some of the group leaders that work on some of these things. So you, you should feel free to contact any of those people for uh, if you're interested in any of these projects for detail. So thank you.